Hello again, everyone. Um, today we are going to talk about foreign exchange market. Right? The foreign exchange market in um, international business. Again, this is very crucial because you're going somewhere, you're making money, and obviously you have to know what is happening in the um, you know, financial markets of the host country, uh, how to repatriate the money, what is happening to the uh, foreign exchange and the exchange rate between the host country and your home country and, and all other things about international finance uh, in, in particular for, for your um, you know, financial planning, uh, for you know, capital budgeting, for your working capital management and all other financial issues in the host country. So uh, for an exchange market, essentially see the name here is a, is a market market for foreign exchanges. And of course, we, we talk about the bilateral relationship. This, this would be a market for converting uh, the currency from, from one country to another, or maybe from the host to, to home or the other way around uh, from home country to the host country. So exchange rate is you know, exchange, you exchange something. So the rate of exchange, we call it exchange rate, is uh, again the, the, the rate or the level at which one currency is converted into another. I uh, might see that like maybe 1200 um, from one currency to another currency, maybe um, ones to US dollar or uh, UN to US dollar and some other exchanges that we, we have seen a lot in the financial, in the let's say in the currency market. Um, so without you know without the foreign exchange market, it would be very difficult to imagine um, the international trade and the international business because you're going somewhere, going to a host country, and you do your operations there. You have to pay, and also you receive your you get your revenues there, you make your net income, and you repatriate the money back into your, your home country. So without a foreign exchange market, right, um, it would be, you know, it's hard to imagine how this kind of like international trade and international business would be attractive enough to anyone. Because if, if we couldn't exchange the money from, from the host country to home country, then Essentially, you couldn't buy anything. There's no benefit, right? no monetary benefit from the international trade or operations. And uh, so, one is a, also the foreign exchange market. The, uh, another function would be uh, to provide some, you know, the this kind of um, hedging activity. Because if you receive money or you have to pay your um, maybe your suppliers, your business clients in another currency, maybe not right now, maybe next month or next year or in the next five years, and you are not sure about the, the level of exchange or the exchange rate between your home currency and um, the, the currency of your business client. So by having the foreign exchange market, somehow you could not only can you do the transaction or payment, but you can also uh, protect the value of, of your transaction by doing the hedging. Of course, it's beyond our scope uh, for today, the hedging, risk management, and also derivative securities. You can watch um, uh, my other videos on derivative securities and risk management. But for today, there is um, a good basic information to know that you know, with, the, with the foreign exchange market, can also protect the value of your operations and all kinds of transactions by, by exchanging early or making um, certain contracts with respect to the, you know, the foreign exchanges that we are interested in. Okay, so functions. Um, conversion is the, I think the major function for, for anything like for transaction, for investment, for, uh, value protection or hedging, and also for speculation. Well, we're going to talk about it, I think, in, a, in more details in, in subsequent slides. 
So currency conversion, um, again, this is very crucial. We are trading in many places in our home country. We are going to host countries. We are exploring, um, we are building factories somewhere else. We are having distribution channels, marketing um, companies everywhere in the world. You could do it anywhere. So each country has its own currency. Uh, with the currency, this is like uh, the means of payment. So if you go to, if you are in, in Korea, of course, you are, we are paying using um, the Korean won. If you go to China, we pay by UN. If you go to the United States, we have the US dollar, have to pay using the US dollar and so on. So every country has its own currency. And um, with the existence of national currency everywhere, so whenever we go, we have to exchange right, our home currency to the, the host currency, uh, be it as a business person or a tourist or any other role that, that you are or you are playing uh, by going there. So um, if you look at this one, right, the fourth point, so who are the participants in the, in the foreign exchange market? Of course, the biggest participants would be the, um, you know, the financial institutions and then uh, big organizations, um, you know, business organizations, investment firms, right? But essentially, financial institutions would be the, the, biggest, the biggest participants in the foreign exchange market. So tourists and, and of course, like uh, individuals are minor participants. Um, maybe in terms of the um, you know, number of people, number of individuals um, is the, the biggest in terms of number, but in terms of significance, right, amount, right, the significance of amount and the effect on the foreign exchange market, individuals, including tourists, are minor, minor participants. So um, companies, business organizations, financial institutions would be the biggest participants in the foreign exchange market. Okay, so what are the functions? What are the uses of foreign exchanges? It's quite obvious. The first one would be for transaction. Okay, so transaction is the, the most obvious use of, of a foreign exchange. So um, have like exporting and uh, so we receive Revenues, we make money there, income from foreign investment, foreign operations. Okay, also from licensing. Maybe if you license um, a certain technology or pattern to, to a foreign firm, then you get uh, royalties from, from the foreign firms in the, in the form of maybe foreign <laughs> currencies. Okay, and uh, so the first, once again, the first uh, function would be for transaction and for transaction um the second one um would be for investment okay so if you look maybe i put here what's the what are the uses the foremost use would be for transaction so transaction purposes you are paying your suppliers your business clients your business partners but you also receive money from your clients, from your buyers, and yeah, any any other relevant entities uh, with whom you have transactions. Right? And the second use is of course uh, investment purposes. So you invest, you invest in other countries um, with physical investments, um, financial investments as well. Uh, portfolio investments, uh, both portfolio investments and and uh, real investments or physical investments. Okay, so we have uh, investment, and the third one would be for hedging or risk management. So you try to manage your risk, especially the foreign exchange risk by going to the foreign exchange market. So you are buying and selling currencies, uh, taking maybe a position in the uh, forward contract 
or option contract or a swap swap transaction and something like that. But the, the main purpose of, of hedging is to protect protect the value of your transaction or your your asset. So it's a um, highly related to risk management activities. So you, you're protecting your asset, right? The value of your, your company, your asset. So the this kind of use is for risk management, for hedging. And the fourth one, uh, which is not, not, not uncommon, is becoming, I think, more and more significant as well is for speculation, for speculation purposes. So you have no um, related activities, nor any any what's that business interest, but you just go go out and take a position in in a currency. Maybe you're taking a long position in in US dollar simply to speculate, or you're holding um, a British pound simply for speculation, or you are taking a short position in euro maybe because you. Again, you you bet you um, you expect euro to depreciate, then you take a short position in euro. Actually, you don't have any no underlying transactions, um, no no business interest involving euro, but you simply go out there to speculate. Right? You take a short position just to bet that euro would depreciate, so you sell it first, something like that. Right? So, speculation purposes could be one of one of the major uses nowadays right? in the in the financial. So in the foreign exchange market. Okay. Um, anytime you have questions, just um, raise your questions or your comments, okay? So we we'll continue a bit. Um, spot and forward and currency swap. Let's spot and forward. This is the, I think the, the, the contrast um, position that we could, you could see in the real market. So whenever we talk about spot, like spot transaction, spot market, this is very easy to imagine. You see, with uh, at the spot, right? something that happens at the spot. So um, with the, the the term spot, we mean um, the deal is made right now. Okay, so we we make the deal right now, and what about the execution? The execution is also conducted right now. Okay, so immediate. No, uh, you make the deal right now. Uh, we make an immediate execution. So by by immediate execution, we mean like T plus two, something like that, right? So uh, two days after the deal is still considered a spot market or spot transaction. So it's not not necessarily. The next five seconds or the next minute, okay, it could happen like two days later. Still consider uh, an immediate execution or the spot market, but essentially, if we talk about the spot market, the spot market, we mean the deal is made right now and the execution is also happening immediately. It could be T plus two, or maybe in some countries it could be defined as T plus three. Right, the, the day plus three, so within three days or within two days, right, depending on your country. What about the uh, forward transaction or forward market? So uh, this is quite interesting, right? When we, whenever we talk about forward market, actually the deal is made right now. You see, there is a similarity here. The deal is actually made right now. So if you have a forward transaction that you promise to buy um, maybe Chinese yuan within six months at uh, maybe seven seven yuan per dollar or something. So you you make the deal right now, but the execution the execution will happen sometime in the future. Sometime in the future could mean what? It could mean next week, right? Next week or next month, next three months, next six months, next year or. Sometime in the future. That's the definition of sometime in the future. It's more than more than three days. Whenever it's more than three days, we call it sometime in the future. So once again, the deal is made right now, but uh, the execution will happen sometime in the future. Could be next week, could be next three months, six months, next year, or something like that. So there's a main difference between 
spot and forward transactions. So the, the deal is made right now for both, but the execution um, will happen in the future for the forward transaction, whereas uh, the execution, execution is immediate for the spot market or spot transaction. So what about currency swap? This is uh, um, a big topic of its own. I also have a video on, on actually two videos on swap transactions. Uh, swap means you exchange something or you exchange maybe an asset, a liability, or yeah, simply a, could be an asset or could be an, could be an obligation or liability. For example, you have, uh, maybe you have uh, um, potential income or even payment or obligation in, in US dollar and another company is having an obligation, a liability in, in Euro. And you think that is profitable for both, right? beneficial for both entities to exchange, exchange their obligations or our, you know, our assets or obligations. So, so you end up paying US dollar and your counterparty ends up paying US dollar. So you are exchanging your obligation. <clears throat> or could be, you are exchanging both um, the currencies and also um, the type of interest payment, right? Could be you have issued, let's say you have issued a debt in US dollar and the nature is like fixed rate. Uh, on the other hand, your counterparty is having um, an obligation in Korean won with variable rate. So you could exchange both. So you end up paying um, Korean won and a variable rate. Now, on the other hand, the counterparty is paying US dollar in fixed rate, right? So we are, we could swap, I could exchange um, an asset or an obligation or anything like that. All right, um, foreign exchange market nowadays is not, not really about physical location. Although, uh, you know, that some cities are famous and, and still still dominant in the foreign exchange market. What's the largest in the world? Of course, it's London. Right? For um, currency market, the biggest is still in London, followed by uh, New York, um, Tokyo, Singapore. Um, of course, for the capital market, the biggest is, is in New York, but for foreign exchange market, the biggest, biggest market is in London. It has been, has been so for same, so many decades. Um, and the transaction volume is really large uh, in the foreign exchange market. Um, in a day, we have more than $5 trillion worth of transactions. You know, like $5 trillion a day, that's crazy. That's a big cake, right? Um, there's, you know, usually a new graduate from like economics and finance, um, we are highly, you know, tempted to go to the financial markets because the pie is big. So we are saying that, you see, look, there are so many players, so many competitors, but the pie is really big. So even with um, uh, small scale operations, you know, small companies, we still enjoy, uh, you know, even a small piece of cake would be, would be good enough for, you know, for many people, you know, for many, uh, many years to come. That's because the pie is so big. You can imagine that like $5 trillion, more than $5 trillion a day, Right, for for the no for uh, daily transaction there's daily transaction even the largest largest capital market in the world like New York Stock Exchange I think in a day the um, <coughs> transaction volume would be uh, would be about maybe 150 billion dollars a day that's already the biggest um, capital market in the world but in the foreign exchange market or you know, the currency market, at the, uh, <clears throat> um, what's it? the currency market has more than $5 trillion a day for the whole world. Uh, so we say that market never sleeps. There's uh, two, what's that? Uh, two things that you can, you can see, two features, two characteristics of the foreign exchange market. Mar uh, market never sleeps. This is so true because you can imagine if the uh, market in one region closes at the other region, uh, commences its operations. If the United States is closing at, let's say, three or four, then the um, European market 
will begin its operations. When the European market um, uh, closes, then the Asian market begins its operations. See, so market never sleeps. Um, most of the new graduates from mostly from undergraduate programs, we were thinking that you know we would go to the the this kind of market, the foreign exchange market, or financial markets in general. Uh, we'd work there for maybe ten years, you know, um, uh, making as much money as possible, uh, saving money, and afterward we quit after thirty two years old or thirty three because you know, the the work is so demanding in the market because the market never sleeps. So uh, most likely, if you work in in the currency market, uh, you will lack you will lack sleep for maybe yeah whatever years you plan to work there. So it's good to you know, make as much money as possible uh, during your tenure, and and then uh, yeah, you quit and you open your own business, maybe some um, slower pace business activities afterward. Okay, so um, the the second feature is the um, no the U.S. dollar. We call it hard currencies. So currencies that 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 are quite dominant in the world, and you can you can mention, of course, U.S. dollar would be the foremost. Um, uh, U.S. dollar, um, euro, I think the second, and then um, Japanese yen, um, British pound, something like that, and um, other currencies like um, Canadian dollar, Singaporean dollar, Australian dollar. Uh, Chinese yuan, I believe, is becoming more and more important, and other uh, currencies, including Korean won as well, because uh, in South Korea you have a very big derivative market, especially the options market, uh, which is very, um, very important in the world, especially again the derivative, uh, in particular the option market. Okay, so we have uh, some hard currencies, and some other currencies are not really hard currencies. So um, maybe the bid and ask spread would be would be wider for less hard currencies. Uh, but again, the important role played by US dollar that to follow from the, the history of uh, international economics uh, from the uh, pure gold system, the semi gold system, then the uh, Bretton Woods, then the uh, floating system, and you know, the uh, monetary systems in the world. And I think after the Second World War, again, the US dollar has, has become the most dominant currency. And I, I believe it would it would continue to be so. Um, yeah, as long as you know, the I think the, the economic system of the world remains the same as it is today, uh, US dollar will be the dominant force. So let's look at some uh, economic theories of exchange rate determination. Um, again, to talk about this, actually, we have to start from the history, which is beyond the scope of, of this course. If you're interested, you, have, you should take the international finance course um, um, in which you will see the history of the monetary system from, again, the um, fixed system, the uh, floating rate and, and uh, all other systems in the international um, monetary system. But uh, most countries in the world right now is having this kind of you know, uh, free floating or managed floating system. So we depend more on the demand and supply of, of currencies. So the demand and supply mechanism would determine the exchange rate right, between two currencies. Okay? Um, some countries are still using the PEG system. So they are, they are pegging their currencies to maybe a, a, a certain currency. So essentially they're using the fixed rate system, but not, not, not many countries are doing that um, anymore because it's quite, um, quite distorted. You know? It will create that uh, market friction and wouldn't be good to the country in the, in the long run. Maybe it's, Comfortable in the short run because you could you could affect the level of exchange rate. For example, in China, uh, China wants a, a depreciating currency, 
right, to be to be cheaper because uh, the country believe that uh, the cheaper currency, the depreciating currency, would support its export, right, the export effort, because the the products produced in China would be relatively cheaper than than other um, other products produced somewhere else. So they believe, right, especially the country believe that. Um, depreciating currency would be beneficial to uh, boost up the the level of export, but again, um, it's not something without without any consequence. If you talk about the uh, international monetary system, because we have the mechanism like going back and forth, and with the uh, with some artificial uh, artificial determination. By by the uh, government policy or central bank pol central bank policy, there will be consequences. Right, the, the opposite way of um, the mechanism. But again, it's beyond our scope. But it's just good to know that for now, um, right now in modern times, most countries are, are using the um, free float system or at least the managed float system. However, um, this kind of you know demand and supply mechanism doesn't really explain or reveal the factors that underlie the demand for or supply of a currency. So we have to uh, you know uh, go deeper into the analysis right, to know what is what is creating demand <clears throat> of a certain currency right now, and uh, what is what is affecting the supply of that currency. Uh, let's look at some concepts here. So the most basic concept would be the law of one price. So the law of one price, um, the popular name or the academic name for it is the purchasing power parity. The law of one price says that uh, if we have the same thing traded in, in many countries, let's say in two countries, then the price of that, that product should be the same right? uh, in, in both countries. Uh, excluding, of course, the transportation costs and barriers to trade. For example, the quota or tariff or some, some other barriers, uh, trade barriers that a, com that a country imposes on a certain product. Um, absent those barriers and transportation costs, we believe that um, the price of, of an asset should be the same. Again, um, with the same quality, and absent the transportation costs and barriers to trade, so, uh, it should be traded at the same price at one place to another. So we call it the absolute, absolute purchasing power parity concept. So the absolute means we believe that it should be the same. So if you're comparing, I think the easiest one would be, I don't know, maybe Apple or McDonald's. This has been classical, classical example. Uh, at McDonald's, if you, if you uh, sell it in, in um, I don't know, in, in, in Korea, you sell it at, uh, I don't know how much, uh, like maybe no, 10,000 or something. But uh, yeah, you can find out by yourself, but you can test in your own currency, okay? Let's say uh, we have this kind of Big Mac that costs uh, maybe five in the United States and in in let's say in uh somewhere in Singapore sells at maybe four the Singaporean dollars and US dollar. So um if we believe in the absolute purchasing power purchasing power parity concept, then the exchange rate should should be what's that four Singaporean dollar per five US dollar. So it should be what um, eighty cents. Okay, eighty cents per U.S. dollar. Right. I mean, if we if if we believe that um, the absolute purchasing power parity holds, right? unfortunately, um, absolute purchasing power parity never holds properly because again, there are many. Um, many, many, or so much noise, you know, many disturbances like the difference in quality, something that we, we couldn't 
compare um, McDonald's when you go to maybe a certain country, like maybe if you go to, I don't know, uh, Southeast Asia, um, Myanmar or uh, somewhere, uh, if you couldn't find the, the quality potatoes that you need, that you need to export from somewhere, maybe the closest would be from, I don't know, from uh, another country like Thailand or from China, from Taiwan or anywhere, then uh, it will add to this kind of you know, um, transportation costs, you know, transaction costs and something like that. So it's, it's hard to compare if we don't have the same quality, right? Because we have to send it from somewhere, some, some materials or inventories. So absolute purchasing power parity says that if we have exactly the same thing, the same product in two countries, then the, the absolute price of that product should be the same. And that could be, that could represent the exchange rate between uh, one currency uh, to another. Okay. So what is the uh, what's the, the the more realistic form of purchasing power parity? We call it the relative form, relative purchasing power parity, not the absolute version. Right? So the uh, again the um, relative version. Actually, we are going to see it in the next slide. Okay, so um, relative version is more about the um, inflation differential between two current countries. So in the absolute version, we use um, whatever proxies like McDonald's, Apple, some other you know, international products that we could find anywhere. Um, and we believe that no, the, the price of the same product should be the same in in many countries, uh, again, absent, you no, know, supposing that transportation costs and barriers of barriers to trade are absent. Mm -hmm. But the um, relative version says that, see, if you have, if you have two countries with different inflation difference, uh, no, in uh, different inflation rates, then the country with a higher inflation rate is more likely to see its currency depreciate. Mm -hmm. Okay, more likely to see uh, the depreciation of its currency. Why? Because you can imagine that higher inflation. Inflation means uh, uh, higher inflation means the uh, increase the amount of increase in the amount of currency is larger than the increase in the product or outputs. So you have you now the circulation of money, by right? the money. I said. Um, Money circulation okay, is larger than uh, the increase in outputs. So it's like excessive. So the increase in the amount of money exceeds that of your you know, product outputs. So it's excessive. Right? That's why the uh, products, your general, you know, general prices increase right, in, in an inflationary situation. So general prices increase and the value of the money decreases because you know, again, once again, uh, inflation means the uh, increase in the amount of, of money, uh, the circulation of money exceeds that of your uh, outputs. Right? So uh, whenever a country has a higher inflation rate, uh, general prices increase, the products become less competitive, then most likely the imported products become more attractive. Right? Imported products become more attractive means uh, the country will buy more imported products because they are cheaper. They are, they are relatively cheaper than the domestic products. So by uh, buying more and more imported products, they need they need the uh, no the currencies right the the other currencies, making a domestic currency depreciate. Okay, so in in the formula we could say that um, if we have this one, the spot rate right now, the spot rate of the exchange rate right now between uh, two currencies. So we are uh, comparing, this is the inflation rate at home. Okay. And to the power of time, of course, right, to the power of time. 
Um, and the denominator is one plus the inflation rate in a foreign country, again, to the power of time, okay, both. Um, so we could, we could predict what would happen to the spot rate in the future. Here, here. So the spot rate at some time in the future, right, relative to the spot rate right now, should be the function of the inflation differential. So you can imagine that the higher, the higher the inflation rate of a country, the more likely that its currency depreciate. Okay? So in other words, we're saying that a country with lower inflation rate is more likely to have an appreciating currency. Okay. So let's look at the uh, one example here, I think it's from Bolivia. Bolivia was, was uh, suffering from huge inflation rate. You see in 1984, 1985, you could see the money supply. So the, the growth in money supply far exceeded the growth of outputs, making the no, general prices increase and the value of money decrease. As we call it uh, depreciation of currency. And can look at the third column there, third column, the exchange rate to US dollar has, yeah, has depreciated from 3,500 3, uh, per dollar to 1.1 million per dollar. That's crazy uh, within, I don't know, within uh, one and a half years. Okay, so uh, I could imagine that you go to McDonald's and you want to buy, I don't know, you want to buy the uh, Big Mac or something and you have to pay like five, five million, like five million pesos or something. And this happened also to many other countries like Zimbabwe and I think other, other countries that, that experienced that, that inflation rate. Um, so what is the like inflation rate is again, another discussion of its own, uh, another topic of its own. But usually uh, we consider uh, an inflation rate of 3% maximum as the um, you know moderate level, quite a uh, tame level of inflation, three percent of below or below, but of course you don't want a negative inflation either because with a negative inflation or deflation, that indicates that the country doesn't doesn't grow. So inflation is like the cost of growth, right? If, we, if you are growing, you have inflation, but can we want a tame level of inflation? Just imagine your body temperature you want um, somewhere between, I don't know, maybe 35, 36, maybe 35.5 and maybe 37.5. That would be the, 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 what's that, the tame, the healthy temperature. But below that, that level, the person is sick and above that level, the, the person is suffering from fever. By the same thing here, we want something that, well, uh, in, the, in the middle, right? mild and tame. Um, empirical tests of the purchasing power parity. Once again, I think the absolute version is not really, not really accurate in the world because it's hard to find uh, a, a country without market friction, without uh, with with the same quality for everything, with um, no transportation costs, no trade barriers, and something like that. Right? It's quite. Um, I think it's not not really. Not really possible to find such a, um, you know, uh, a situation, right? The characteristic of, of a country, hard to find, you know, hardly possible to find. But um, the relative version, the relative version of the purchasing power parity, is somehow accurate right? in most of most of the cases that we we could observe right? in the real world. This relative version um, has been has been relied upon by policymakers, you know, by by um, by financial analysts from comp for uh, was it by companies and and all other um, relevant entities to make you know foreign exchange prediction or projection uh, about the spot rate sometime in the future. Okay, another um, another theory that tries to explain the relationship between uh, inflation and 
interest rate would be, we, we call it Fisher effect, um, taken from the name of a top economist named uh, Fisher. So Fisher effect tries to you know, connect the inflation rate and interest rate. And this is quite easy to imagine. If you have a um, higher inflation rate, and most likely the central bank will increase the interest rate as well. Why? Because the, the, the country is overheating, right? the economy is overheating. So if you have a higher and higher inflation, for example, in the United States right now, it's more than 7% year on year. So it's overheating. Whenever the economy is overheating, it's very dangerous to keep it going as it is because it will burst. Right? You can imagine like someone is having a uh, fever and you ask the person to play right, basketball or uh, football or something and most likely the person will collapse on the field or maybe the person will die because it's having fever and you ask him to to run you know to work harder so um, whenever the inflation is high the companies in in like overheating overheating circumstances then the central bank has to increase the interest rate to absorb you know the excessive amount of you know, excessive amount of uh, money circulation to the banking system so by increasing the interest rate, uh, we are putting on break. Right? We, we put on break to, to the journey. You know, right? we, we are breaking and um, essentially we are absorbing the excessive amount of again, money circulation into the banking system to curb inflation, right? to cool down the economy. That's why higher inflation is usually followed by higher interest rate. So according to Fisher, we can write it this way. So if you have that one plus inflation rate at home, inflation rate at home, uh, relative to one plus inflation rate in the foreign country, uh, of course, to the power of time, okay? To the power of time, uh, this should correspond with one plus uh, interest rate at home divided by one plus interest rate in the foreign country, again, to the power of time. So we are saying that they have the, you know, the uh, uh, you know, positive relationship, right? The, they are positively correlated between inflation and interest rate in, in a country. And um, if we continue the, the, you know, the parity conditions there, we have the relative, relative version of purchasing power parity, that we have the, the Fisher effect. And we also have the international Fisher effect. So international Fisher effect relates uh, the interest rate and uh, currency movement, the foreign exchange movement. Okay, so we, we could imagine now with the spot rate right now, right, spot rate right now, what will happen to the spot rate sometime in the future a spot rate sometime in the future, uh, this should, should be reflected by the interest rate differential. Right? According to the international, international Fisher effect, um, there is, uh, again, the, uh, what's that direct relation between interest rate and, and the spot rate sometime in the future. So we are saying that a country with a higher interest rate is more likely to see its currency depreciate. And vice versa, a country with a lower interest rate is more likely to see its currency appreciate, right? It's just the same as the uh, inflation differential, but here we are using the interest rate differential. So we call it um, international official effect. Right. So once again, the Fisher effect, uh, we are you no, know, we, we are relating the inflation rate and interest rate, and maybe it's good to write it here. 
if you see nominal rate, so interest rate, nominal interest rate is actually uh, a function of, or um, is having like two components. Like the first one is real interest rate. And of course the second component is inflation, inflation rate. So if you are somewhere on the street, you know, you don't have any calculator, you could, you could approximate the nominal interest rate as the real interest rate plus inflation. And you know that in, in the world, I think most countries are more or less having the same, in, uh, the same real interest rates. But because of, and because of different inflation rates, then the nominal, nominal rates are also different right, between one country and another. So from the equation, you could guess what, what makes the difference between a country's um, nominal interest rate and another country's interest rate would be the inflation rate. Because the real interest rate is more, no, most of the time similar between one country and another. But of course, uh, in, in a particular time, it could be different. Like a country's real interest rate might go up for a while. And we have some measure about that. Right? In international finance, you'll learn about the, you know, determining the real interest rate in, in a, a certain country. For example, you see that in Japan, for the last 20 years, uh, we are seeing an increasing real interest rate. Okay, so, uh, yeah, this kind of, you know, uh, making, I'm sorry, I think the other way around, right? So in, uh, within the, I think the, um, for the last 20 years, we are seeing a, a lower real interest rate in Japan, for example, making like uh, the, you know, the product making, the production in Japan more and more expensive right? because again, they have uh, <coughs> real interest rate and real exchange rate, they go hand in hand, right? Because um, we just saw it here, that a country, with, a country with a higher interest rate is more likely to see its currency depreciate, right? But a country with a higher real rate right, is more likely to see its currency appreciate. I think that's happening, for example, um, like in Japan, like uh, product prices become more and more expensive. Quality is really good, but you know, th th this kind of uh, real rate appreciate, uh, no, real rate increase that leads to uh, foreign exchange appreciation uh, could really, you know, uh, deter right, the competitiveness of, of the products of the country, right, because Again, we have uh, uh, like more expensive prices and have to compete with other countries and something like that. So it's quite, actually it's quite, uh, quite dynamic, you know, because we have the nominal interest rate that we just saw, right? actually higher, higher interest rate will lead to depreciation. But if you talk about real interest rate, this will lead to appreciation. And currency appreciation is not necessarily a good thing, right? And you've seen like, uh, in, in the case of some countries like Japan, they have been, now uh, producing world-class quality products, um, very good quality control, you know, like top brands also in the world, but many of, of their products are you know, having a big difficulty competing in, in, the, in the, especially in the consumer products market because, because of the um, uh, currency appreciation, right? the real, real currency appreciation affected by the real uh, interest rate. So they're having, like um, higher, you know, um, real interest rate than other countries, you know, making the currency more and more likely to appreciate. Okay, so it's, again, it's very dynamic between the nominal and inflation. But in um, in economics, uh, whenever we, we want to estimate it more accurately, we should write it this way, like nominal, this should equal uh, one plus, real interest rate uh, multiplied by one plus inflation. So this is a more, uh, more precise estimate right? with, with the uh, no mathematical accuracy. But if you're on the street, you could 
approximate the nominal rate as real interest rate plus inflation. Um, some uh, behavioral economics here, behavioral economics and, and finance. Um, now, this kind of theories might not might not work in the short run, see, because in the short run, we have a lot of like psychological effect. Uh, we can call it like herding behavior. Herding. Herding means you're following. Uh, you're following um, the opinion of, of uh, an opinion leader or uh, um, maybe a famous famous trader like George Soros or some other you know famous traders. So we just follow whatever position they are taking. Okay, we call it uh, uh, call it herding behavior or bandwagon effect. It's just similar thing. So bandwagon, you jump into jump into a bandwagon. You just follow whatever the big players are are taking. You know the position they are taking. They take a long position, then you take a long position as well, and vice versa. So um, here we are, we are saying that in the short run, uh, there might be some you know, deviations from, from the theoretical explanations, right? the, the theories that, that we have been holding. But in the long run, of course, um, most of the time the theories work and could explain the, for example, the spot rate in the future or the forward rate in the future um, and some other you know, projections. They could somehow you know um, make a, a, a an accurate projection but in the short run there are a lot of like psychological you know um, effects or patterns that that could deviate from uh, the the theories or the concepts that we have known right in in the common practice forecasting is it is it um, Useful or not useful, it depends on the belief that you hold, the school of thought that 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 you hold. Um, the efficient market and inefficient market. So there are two schools of thought. The first one is efficient market. Okay, the efficient market people will say that the um, asset price has reflected all available information, essentially what, what they're saying. So market efficiency concept, um, uh, economics and finance people, if they believe in efficient market, it, it means that they believe that um, security prices or asset prices have reflected all available information. So um, any kind of additional information like fundamental analysis or technical analysis will not help much, right? Because the prices have reflected all available information. So if there's a, a new piece of information, it would be reflected, it would be incorporated quickly into the asset price, including a currency. So uh, if we believe that the market is efficient enough, then uh, the forward rate should be should be the unbiased predictor. Remember when we talk about, uh, we have the spot rate, and we have the spot rate right now, we have the spot rate sometime in the future, and we have the forward rate. So forward rate, let's see, remember, the deal is made right now, but the execution will happen in the future, uh, sometime in the future. So if the market is efficient, then the forward rate should be an unbiased predictor of the future spot rate. So the, the forward rate that we have right now should be uh, an unbiased and consistent predictor of the future spot rate. But if the market is not efficient, then we still, we still could make, you know, projection about this aside from this one, because we believe that this, the forward rate might not be <clears throat> might not be a good predictor of the future spot rate. So uh, still the additional analysis would be beneficial. But if you analyze more, you include more analysis like technical, fundamental and technical analysis, and you believe that you could predict the future spot rate more accurately than the prediction of the forward rate that we have right now. Okay, that's essentially, I think, the, the, the main difference. So in efficient market belief that, no, uh, 
uh, some information have not been reflected in current prices, including a currency. Okay, so consequently, the forward rate is not is not the best predictor of the future spot spot rate. So the forward rate is not not uh, an unbiased or best predictor of the future spot rate. Um, meaning that you know you could do a lot of analysis to predict, right? To to make your you know analysis to make your predictions. And one of them would include this one, right? Professional exchange rate forecasts. If you if you have a company and you believe that the future spot rate is uncertain, uh, couldn't be explained perfectly by the, the forward rate, that you might want to hire maybe professional exchange rate forecasts. You want to buy the forecasts uh, to to predict the what's that the uh, future spot rate because maybe you are having transaction two years from now or six months from now, and you want to make sure that your, uh, the, the movement of the currency is favorable to you. So you might, you might want to hire this kind of forecast at professional firms, prof professional uh, you know, uh, forecast companies, for, uh, you know, uh, this kind of company. And um, because you believe that you know, the market is not efficient enough, right? So you could, you could still do additional analysis, buying forecasts and something. Uh, so assuming the uh, market is inefficient, if you believe that there is, or there are loopholes, you know, there's room for maneuver in predicting the future spot rate, then you believe that the market is not, not an entirely efficient. Then you can do uh, two types of analysis, uh, the fundamental analysis and technical analysis. So fundamental, as the name indicates, fundamental means you incorporate fundamental fundamental variables like uh, what are they like this one right money supply growth rate, inflation, interest rate, you know some some other you know um, shocks to the economy or to the uh, monetary system or something, including balance of payment positions and so on. So you incorporate the fundamental variables. That's why we call it fundamental analysis. So you try to predict or to, to estimate the fundamental value of a currency, right? So fundamental value of a currency. Uh, on the other hand, with the technical analysis, technical analysis means you try to read the chart using maybe um, historical prices, historical returns, historical trading volumes, all about the, the past data uh, that you could, you could harness to make projection about the future, right? So you, you're having the, the charts with all kinds of uh, indicators. Then you, you believe that the, by reading the chart, by making projection to the future, using, um, I don't know, oscillator, you know, all kinds of uh, techniques, right? The, um, the what's that? The MACD, right? The moving average convergence divergence analysis or something like that. So using a lot of uh, charting techniques, right, you try to predict uh, the the direction and also the level of uh, ex exchange rate uh, sometime in the future. So the next one is about comfortability of a currency. Um, many of the currencies in the world are freely convertible, meaning that there's no restriction, no, no restriction for residents and non-residents to purchase you know, unlimited amounts of, of uh, other foreign currencies with the, with the local currency. Uh, so, Essentially, if you go somewhere, right, you go to a country, you're having operations there, you receive your revenues in that currency, and then you want to, you want to exchange the local currency with other currencies, you can freely do it, right? This is called uh, freely convertible. But what about this one? Now we have some restriction here, externally convertible. So if we are foreigners or non-residents, we are the only, you know, the only entity or the only party who can, who can exchange 
the local currency into uh, into other currencies. So externally comfortable, meaning that the the local people, the citizens couldn't do it. I think we we have some countries uh, with this kind of restrictions, like the uh, its citizens are not allowed to exchange local currency into other currencies. But for foreigners, they can do it because maybe they they are tourists, they are business people, they come to have some operations there. And when they leave, they have to, somehow they have to uh, convert uh, that currency into, into um, their, their currencies, their respective currencies when they leave. And um, also there, there are some currencies that are non-convertible at all. Um, not sure, maybe because of the, maybe, I, I don't know, my political decision or simply because it's not recognizable somewhere else, right? This could happen. I think, what, what can you do if you find this kind of situation in your international operations or international trade? Then most likely you have to produce something there. I think, um, I don't know, in maybe 1960s or 70s, when uh, Ben and Jerry uh, firstly went to Soviet Union, you could imagine that American, you know, the capitalistic ice cream was going to Soviet Union at that time, when 60s and 70s or 70s. Um, and surprisingly, they made a lot of money there. So the, um, the, the, what's that, the Soviet people loved it. So they made a lot of money. Unfortunately, there are two problems there. The first problem was capital control. So it's like a non-convertible, no non-convertible uh, system. You know, they they couldn't get it out anyway. So there was a capital control in Soviet Union. But secondly, the currency itself was not was not a hard currency, and even not not really convertible because not many people wanted to convert it. So my point here is that non-convertibility could happen because of two things, right? The first thing is capital control imposed by, by the, the host country. But the second possibility is the currency itself is not, not recognizable somewhere else. It's just like having you know, the, the money in, in your monopoly game. You know, you're playing, playing in monopoly game and you have the money. You could buy a hotel or something like that in the game, but of course you couldn't use the monopoly money to buy something at, at Walmart or something somewhere, right? It's not recognizable. Uh, Non-convertibility could happen because of capital control or non-recognizability of the currency. But uh, again, I think in, in the um, modern world as, um, as it is today, most of the currencies are freely convertible. Some of them are externally convertible and few of them are non-convertible. Maybe in some countries uh, that you could, you could imagine, um, the currencies are not convertible at all. Um, uh, some reasons that restrictions by the government, maybe they want to preserve their foreign exchange reserve. So, um, yeah, they don't want the foreign exchange reserve uh, depleted because maybe foreigners come, they do operations there, and whenever they leave, they they exchange back to to uh, no their respective currencies. Um, that being the case, now foreign exchange reserve will be depleted in in the host country. So some countries don't want to do it, and they they uh, impose. Uh, such a restriction, maybe a capital control, something like that. Um, yeah, some countries are stockpiling US dollar as foreign ex exchange reserve, as we know. Um, maybe they they want to strengthen the strengthen the foreign exchange position, reserve position, so they don't want to, uh, you know, deplete the foreign exchange reserve whenever foreigners go right, go back to their own country, and. Uh, yeah, the, this kind of phenomenon like residents and non-residents rush to convert the domestic currency into another currency, we call it capital flight. Maybe there's a deep crisis in that country. I think it happened um, maybe every other decade, 
right? In, in maybe in 1998, there was a big crisis in Southeast Asia and many of the local citizens in many countries in Southeast Asia, they just you know, um, immediately converted their local currencies to US dollar, uh, so capital flight in the sense that they, they got rid of their, their domestic currencies but they were holding US dollar for, for uh, safety reasons, you know, for as a, as a safe haven at that time. Um, so what, what should you do again if we have this kind of uh, capital control? Like what Ben and Jerry did at that time, they couldn't get the money out. And even if they could get the Soviet money out, the ruble or something, um, the currency was not really recognizable in, in, in the world. So what they could do was counter trade. So they produce the uh, merchandise, you know, like marks, t-shirts, uh, all kinds of merchandise there. So they got the products out. Right? So this is the, the, the thing they could do. Couldn't get the money out. So they, they had to produce anything there and got the products out rather than money. All right, um, so the next one is about the um, foreign exchange rate risk. Again, you study more, you study this more in risk management course. You see the uh, foreign exchange rate is, is an um, integral part of the uh, risk management system. Um, we have at least some exposure here, transaction, trans transaction exposure. Uh, this is like the income, from um, from the transaction, and then translation. Translation is about the financial statements of a company. When you translate, you know that you translate your uh, financial reports or financial statements in your host in the host country. You translate it back to your to the you know, the accounting system in your home country. There might be translation exposure there. And economic exposure is more about the future, future earning power. What will happen to the future? What will happen in the future um, with respect to the foreign exchange rate? For example, you're holding, you're holding a lot of um, Japanese yen and going to the future, the Japanese yen might depreciate. Uh, if it depreciates, you're losing a lot of money because you are holding you're taking a lot of uh, long position in Japanese yen. As for example, you have economic exposure there uh, concerning the future uh, related to the prices, the sales, the costs and everything. And another possibility for uh, economic exposure would be what will happen to our production in, in Korea uh, if, if one keeps appreciating, then prices will be more now the what's the prices will be more expensive, uh, sales would be higher, but costs would be higher as well. So something about the future. So translation exposure is more about the past because we have financial statements. When we translate it back, um, we'll have that translation exposure. We might have uh, some gains or some losses, and you put that one in the other comprehensive income and in, in, in the accounting. Uh, the what's that? The accounting system we call it um, other comprehensive income on your income statement. You have the gains or losses from your translation exposure. So translation exposure is more about the the, the past, uh, the historical you know uh, nature of of the company operations. Economic exposure is more about the future. So what can we do here? Uh, reducing the Translation and transaction exposure. This is something about something about the historical no historical account. So we could use the lead strategy and also the lag. So we could try to you no know, lead strategy means um, you try to preempt, do the preemptive you know preemptive action. So if you know that the uh, foreign currency of the host country is going to depreciate, then you want to collect your receivable as soon as possible, right? But you want to pay your accounts payable as slow as possible. Now, this is just a strategy, right? If you know that the uh, the host, host country's currency will 
likely depreciate in the near future. So you want to collect your receivable as soon as possible, but you try to slow down the payment of your payables, right? This, I think, uh, you know, just simple logic could, could imagine that. But lag strategy would be the, the other way around because you, if you predict, uh, you, you have a projection that the host country's currency will appreciate in the near future. So it's better to delay the collection of your receivable, wait a bit until that currency appreciates. And when you collect your receivable and that currency has appreciated, and when you translate it back, you'll get more money in the what's that in terms of your, your home currency, right? And of course, the other way around, you try you you try to if you know that the currency will will depreciate. Uh, in the near future, then you want to speed up your, your payment of the payable. So before, for the other currency appreciates, now you immediately you pay your payables. So you don't, you don't suffer from the, uh, you know, the, the appreciation of the host country's currency or the depreciation of your home currency, right? What about the, um, the other exposure? So for transaction and translation, you have the lead and lag strategy depending on your expectation or projection about the host country's currency. What about the economic exposure? Well, economic exposure is about you know um, something that might happen in the future, um, the appreciation or depreciation of the host currency, and that will affect your your um, asset holding right now in in other currencies your uh, production, you know, your cost, something like that. So I think for economic exposure, we have no choice but to do the risk management with the hedging mechanisms, okay? Risk management or hedging mechanisms by, um, at, at first, maybe you want to do the on balance sheet hedging. So on balance sheet hedging, you try to, uh, as much as possible, you know, uh, smoothen the holdings of um, assets and liabilities in other currencies. So if they match one another as much as possible, you will get a lot of help from the on balance sheet hedging. But we could couldn't do it perfectly yeah. for sure by right? the on balance sheet hedging. That's why we we need to do the off balance sheet hedging by um, you know holding. Um, long or short positions in forward or futures contracts, uh, option contracts or swap contracts, okay? Um, other steps for managing foreign exchange risk. Um, yeah, I think the some uh, mixed strategies that depending on how we, we see the I said the uh, situation in, in one particular country. So we should adopt the, like the tactics and strategies, right? Tactics for the short, short run, strategies for the long run. Um, so it's better to do the, you know, here the central control of exposure rather than allowing every division or every unit to do its own risk management. So um, I'll give you one illustration here. But if you have like, uh, let's say a simple example, you have two divisions, right? If the division A, uh, division B, uh, you have whatever, maybe toy um, toy business, the division B is the, I don't know, maybe lifestyle lifestyle division. Right? Division A is the toys, no, uh, toys business. Um, if like division A has, um, long position exposure in, let's say Korean won, I don't know, maybe 10 billion, see? Right, 10, yeah, something like that, right? 10, 10 billion. And um, it has like a short, let's say, yeah, we have other things like long position. Long means like more, more holding position than than uh, selling, right? More buying than selling position. Another would be 
I don't know, maybe uh, a British pound, okay? Uh, maybe one million. Okay, it has a short position in, um, let's say, Australian dollar at five million. Okay, and division B, for for some reasons, they have this kind of like short position in a British pound of like 500,000. Okay, and they have long position in a Canadian dollar, let's say $100,000. So if you look at this one, uh, there are many differences here, but look at this one, right? The uh, they have a similar currency here. Division A has a like long position of a million pounds. On the other hand, Division B has five hundred thousand pounds. So if you you know do the you know uh, 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 central you know the central control of risk management in your risk register, you could immediately see that they could they could cancel out a bit, right? They could they could uh, neutralize a bit right between the long and the short. So if you match both divisions in, in terms of their their holding of currencies, you know that uh, the the remaining exposure is only five hundred thousand long. This is the only the the exposure left right because we know that we have a short position by division B. 500,000 at long position there. So the, the remaining exposure is actually long 500,000. But if you allow both divisions to do their, their own risk management, so division A, you know, knowing that they're long, you know, they have long position, uh, 1 million, then they will, they'll make their own uh, forward or futures contract. Uh, division B will make their own forward or futures or option contract. Uh, that will increase the transaction costs. Okay, but by doing it in the no in the headquarters by right, the, the central control system actually we could we could um do the on balance sheet hedging we could neutralize we could match a bit right? so the remaining exposure is only five hundred thousand, and this could be done uh more i think more efficiently by by the the central unit right the central central control of exposure rather than allowing every unit to do it by by itself and we should Again, uh, transaction and translation. This is mostly about the uh, current and the past. Uh, economic exposure is more about the future. Uh, we just saw it. Um, so the need to forecast cannot be overstated, meaning that uh, I think in the real world, more analysts and practitioners believe that the market is not entirely efficient, not really efficient. That's why they, they, they believe that the professional forecast services are beneficial, meaning that the uh, actually the forward rate is not, a, not an unbiased and consistent uh, predictor of the future spot rate. Or in other words, additional analysis are still useful, could do the fundamental, the technical analysis to make a better projection about the future spot rate. Um, good reporting system is, is needed. Good reporting systems are needed. Um, so the central, you know, central function could regularly monitor the risk register, risk management, you no know, dashboard, and something. And um, they should produce like monthly foreign exchange exposure reports. So, in other words, I think almost all the points here um, suggest that a company should have like a central system. Uh, to to handle the foreign exchange risk rather than allowing every division or every unit to do um, the risk management mechanism on its own because we could save a lot of a lot of time a lot of money also that transaction costs and everything uh, should we need the the right, derivative transaction then the the central what's that the the central control of exposure could do it more efficiently right by saving a lot of transaction costs. All right, I think uh, that's all about the introduction to foreign exchange market. Once again, if you are interested, uh, you should take the international finance course um, where we will discuss in details um, from the macroeconomic point of view and also the micro, 
micro side of um, international finance and, and uh, hedging mechanisms. Uh, thank you for your, your um, coming and see you next time. <laughs>